just to continue on, on this morning's session, I, I just wanted to leave the stage to uh, uh, a, a very interesting fireside chat uh, organized by you know my good friend Stacey Hope. Uh, Stacey Hope is the managing director of Women Mining UK, also uh, a consultant to various United Nations agencies, so definitely a champion of ESG in the mining sector. Stacey will actually interview Elizabeth Gaines, who's going to be joining us right now. Elizabeth is a FFI Global Ambassador for Fortescue Metal Group. You obviously know uh, Elizabeth from her time as CEO of Fortescue uh, Metals Group from 2018 to August this year. Um, there'll be so many things to say about uh, Elizabeth Gaines, and I'll just say that she was uh, ranked in the top two of 2019 Fortune Magazine Business Person of the Year. I actually believe she should be number one, but you know, top two was still good enough maybe, I guess. And anything that you've seen in different jurisdictions of the success of Fortescue actually is the result of her leadership. So please take it away, Stacy, and uh, we'll be very happy to listen from uh, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Remy, and I guess I don't need to introduce you, Elizabeth, as Remy did a wonderful job, but thank you for being here. Great to be with you, Stacey. And I think maybe we should just get right into it. Let's do it. So in September of this year, Fortescue announced a very aggressive pathway to decarbonization at the UN General Assembly. And maybe just framing this, Fortescue was one of the very few mining companies that actually attended COP27 mm. this year. Uh, one of the major criticisms was last year, at COP26, we didn't have mining represented at COP26, which is incredulous to me. So framing it that way, there is a question about COP27, but at the end, um, can you walk us through what is this decarbonization mm. pathway? Well, Fortescue, about a, uh, over a year ago, we made, we set a target to achieve, we started with net zero emissions by 2030. So that was pretty ambitious and that's a couple of decades ahead of many in our sector. But we just have the view and the science proves it that 2050 is just simply too late. So we set a target for scope one and two emissions for net zero by 2030. And then recently at, uh, at UNGA in September, we've actually um, published our plan to achieve that because there, there are some skeptics that say, well, how, how can you achieve net zero? And actually we've gone a step further. We're now saying real zero by 2030, not net zero. So we won't be relying on offsets. And that plan, we're investing 6.2 billion US to fully decarbonise Fortescue and our iron ore operations. So for those who are less familiar with us, we mine and ship about 190 million tonnes of iron ore every year, and, uh, and it's those mining operations, and we consume about 700 million litres of diesel uh, in the process, uh, and it's that mining operation that we will fully decarbonise by 2030. So it's an ambitious goal, but we do have a plan, and I think it's really important, I think, to, to demonstrate that heavy industry can achieve that, uh, that process of decarbonisation, and I guess for many in the mining sector, would be familiar with the fact that we're not operating in an environment where there's a ready-made transmission infrastructure. We're in the remote areas of Western Australia. So we have to develop transmission infrastructure. We have to develop the replacement fleet, uh, green fleet, haul trucks. Um, so there's a lot that we need to do to put the building blocks in place, but we're determined to achieve real zero by 2030. Um, and we've got a very uh, specific plan. And we're doing it not just because we think it's the right thing to do, we do think it's the right thing to do, but we're doing it because it makes good business sense. So by eliminating the use of over 700 million litres of diesel every year, we estimate our savings will be in the order of $800 million uh, a year based on current prices. And there is, a, there is a world where you could envisage where the oil prices could be even higher. So we're actually uh, implementing strategies to introduce lower cost renewable energy, protect our margins, ensure we have security of supply of energy for our mining operations. Uh, and if you overlay that with, if you were relying on offsets, the ability to procure offsets and the cost of offsets, or in fact, uh, if the government were to introduce some sort of carbon tax in Australia, then you could find your cost base could be significantly different. So we think this is absolutely the right thing to do. It's also the smart thing to do in terms of future-proofing our business and protecting those margins. And we've enjoyed pretty good margins for some time. And we want to make sure that we continue to be highly profitable. So there's a very good 
business reason for doing this. Um, and when we run the numbers and we look at our plan that we've published, mm -hmm. the returns on that are significant. This is not an easy task. No, it's not. <laughs> And, you know, we, we reference real zero versus net zero. How are we defining real zero? That's a great question. And I think as an industry, we also need to look at some of these standards that will emerge because uh, there's a lot of talk at the moment about targets. Um, you look at sustainable financing. So there's, fu there's plenty of financing available for genuine sustainable um, projects or, or projects based on sustainable outcomes. Um, but the definitions of net zero versus real zero, in our view, real zero is that we have eliminated emissions where, um, and we've eliminated the use of fossil fuel and we are not using any offsets uh, to mitigate any, I guess, residual emissions that are harder. There are some areas that are quite hard to abate, but we are looking at, a, at real zero. So no, no offsets and eliminating fossil fuel. It's still quite complex, especially mm. when we think of mining historically not being defined as the most technologically advanced industry. And we need a lot of innovation. We need a lot of technology to meet uh, real zero. So what does that uh, technological advancement pipeline look like for Fortescue? Well, I would actually argue that I think mining is very technology driven and very innovative. If I think about our operations in Western Australia, we are operating the majority of our mining fleet from Perth, thousands of kilometres from the actual mine sites. So we have autonomous haulage, we use remote operations for our trains, for our ship loaders. Um, so we, I, I see this as high tech. Um, and I think certainly uh, Western Australia and Australia in general, the mining industry is, is very, uh, uh, high on technology. So I'm not, I, I don't think we should feel um, daunted by the task ahead of us from a technology perspective, but it does actually take a lot of work and effort and we're putting those building blocks in place. So we've actually established our own green fleet team and that team is looking at the future of a haul truck, which currently, you know, big, big proportion of our 700 million litres of diesel is our haulage fleet. So we're working on both a battery um, solution, battery electric, as well as hydrogen fuel cell. And it might be that both applications, some might be for short haul distances and others might be for longer haul distances. Uh, we've got plenty of renewable energy in where we operate in Western Australia. We've got sun, we've got wind. Uh, but I think one of the biggest changes to the way that we operate our mining operations is we operate 24 hours a day. Uh, 365 days a year and we're used to energy being available all the time and what the team are working on and is quite a big shift from a technology perspective is much more of a demand response so when the energy is available uh, that's when we would optimize our operations during the day and then we might do other activities uh, when the sun isn't shining we, we obviously are looking at storage as well but that demand response, I think, will be quite a shift in the way that we operate our mining operations. So we've got a green fleet team. We're looking right across the mining fleet. We're looking at the haul trucks. Uh, we're also uh, at, on our trains, and we're looking at the use of gravitation to actually have an infinity train because of the gravitational decline between Port Hedland and where our mines are with, the, with a battery uh, electric solution for our locomotives, we think we can actually operate our, um, our trains without using um, uh, fossil fuels. So a lot of technology development underway, but as I said, I actually think the mining industry, if I look at the work we've done on um, autonomy more broadly and the safety benefits we've had as, as a result, I think we actually have absolutely the right credentials to achieve our, our targets. Absolutely. And I'm quite sure that with the impact that the technological advancement will have on not just Fortescue, but on the industry as a whole, if we're looking at future proofing and looking at perhaps learnings from Fortescue, there is value in you probably being at the forefront of this. Well, and, yeah. yeah, and I guess maybe speaking on value and shareholder values, how are your commitments translating into value for your shareholder? Are they seeing it as part of future proofing? Are we looking at 
what are the returns on investments? How are we divide, defining value for your shareholders? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think there's still many um, around board tables and shareholders who see this as, I wouldn't say box ticking, but there's, they're, they're seeing it because actually, yes, we, we should decarbonise. Our, our job and part of my job is to is to really um, demonstrate the value that will be created. So through investing that six point two billion dollars, we'll, we'll actually between now and twenty thirty, when with over that investment time frame, the the net will be about three billion because we'll save on our estimates about three billion dollars through that process. And thereafter, it's about eight hundred million dollars a year. So if you run the numbers, it's actually a compelling um, investment and really does future proof. And that's not taking into account what a carbon charge might mean for our, our business, or uh, if if you rely on offsets, the cost of offsets. So. We, we have to put forward that economic case and I, I would put the challenge to the whole industry that this is actually, it is the smart thing to do. It's not just an ESG imperative, it's actually you know, in terms of future proofing your business, in terms of uh, protecting margins in the future, this is critically important and it does, it does require, um, I guess, targets to be set, investments to be made, but you can absolutely put the case that this is, uh, this is actually in the shareholders' interests, and it will actually create long-term sustainable value. And in terms of the technology that we're developing, you know, our plan is that we will commercialise some of that. Um, so we've, we have a partnership with Liebherr uh, because we this year we bought Williams Advanced Engineering based in Oxford, who are actually experts at battery uh, technology and battery management because we've found that the other OEMs were a, a bit slow in terms of what we were looking to achieve. So we've acquired Williams, we've entered a partnership with Liebherr, um, and that partnership will mean that we'll, we'll actually be supplying the technology to power the haul trucks. And as time develops, uh, we would intend to commercialise that technology as well. So, I, and I think there will be opportunities, because if we can really crack how do we get the same efficiency from a battery electric haul truck as a diesel-powered haul truck, then um, there'll be many others, I'm sure, who'll be interested in, in that technology. We've been focused uh, quite a lot on collaborations and partnerships across, um, well, to meet these ESG targets, especially when we look at decarbonization. And you mentioned this partnership mm. with Lieber. Um, what are some of your, maybe some of Fortescue's more interesting, innovative collaborations that you've been seeing? I'm putting it out there, throwing in a... Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because to develop our renewable energy uh, in the Pilbara, we have to work with local communities. Um, so that partnership actually starts with, you know, we're talking large scale, uh, two to three gigawatts of energy that we're going to require to decarbonise our operations. So we have to work with the local communities because these are large scale um, projects. Uh, so that collaboration actually starts literally on the ground, working with our, particularly in Western Australia, our nat native tidal partners and taking that to the next step where we're actually um, giving them contracts and training them how to be um, a you know, partner with us in the context of the installation of whether it's the, the solar um, generation or wind generation. Um, so those partnerships and working with communities is critically important. The broader partnerships with Liebherr is another good example. Um, and then we're also partnering with government because certainly in Australia, uh, the Australian government see uh, this transition to green energy as a significant opportunity for our country and our economy. And that's both through decarbonising uh, the technologies that will be developed that can be commercialised the skills that that will require from our workforce as well as ultimately the export of green energy to other markets in the same way that iron ore and LNG have been significant markets for Australia. There is, the government gen, uh, genuinely sees renewable energy as a significant export opportunity. So we're partnering with government as well. And maybe you'll have to educate me a little bit because you know, looking at jurisdictions such as the US, the UK, the EU, we're seeing this move towards climate-related uh, yeah. financial disclosures. What does that look like for the Australian government? And are we seeing 
a bit more innovation within government when it comes to decarbonization and working with mining companies? Because it sounds as though there is. But for those of us who aren't quite familiar with the Australian government's... Um, well, we had a change of government uh, this year, and certainly the, the new government, we now have a Labor government in Australia, are more, they're more ambitious in terms of our climate um, targets. My personal view is we could be even more, more ambitious. Um, but there is a recognition of this energy transition and that it's a significant opportunity for Australia and, and our economy. Uh, and so we're encouraging that uh, with government. Having said that, the approvals processes we need to go through, the regulatory approvals to, obviously for any renewable project is still significant. And it's that balancing that red tape with the ambitions of government that we're still trying to, to navigate. So I, I do think, but the, you look at the US with the Inflation Reduction Act and the incentives that are there now for uh, renewable energy. And I think that's a reminder to governments that if you put the right settings in place, that will attract investment because I think we will see a flood of investment into the US into renewable energy because of the Inflation Reduction Act. So I think that's, it's, that's a reminder, I think, to all governments and, and Australia that um, other governments are really uh, focusing on the impacts of climate change and what needs to occur to, uh, to really accelerate that transition because quite frankly the science does prove that 2050 is too late and we will not achieve the Paris targets of one and a half degrees warming. Um, we will certainly, if you look at all of the projects, fossil fuel projects that have been approved in, in recent times and under construction, that we, we, just, we just won't achieve that and obviously exacerbated by the energy crisis that we're seeing particularly here in Europe. So it's, it's really challenging. Uh, I think heavy industry and the mining sector does have an important role to play in being more ambitious to, ta to tackle uh, decarbonisation. And, and if Fortescue is an example, it's one example of an Australian-based uh, mining company uh, investing significantly, um, but doing it because we know that that helps to future-proof our business and protect our margins. And because we're talking about mining in the context of energy transition, what would you say is the energy outlook for Europe and the rest of the world? Well, look, there's, there is there's a genuine energy crisis. There's been underinvestment in, uh, in energy for some time now, particularly renewable energy. We're seeing strong demand already. We know Germany, for example, we've got uh, an agreement with E.ON in Germany to supply five million tonnes of green hydrogen. Uh, they'd like to have that by the middle of this decade. It's, it'll probably take us a little bit longer uh, to achieve five million tonnes, but certainly we're seeing very strong demand for green energy. Uh, security of supply of energy is critically important. And for our business, um, you know, we've seen the oil price, we used to model the oil price at around 60 or $70 a barrel, we've seen it over $100 a barrel. That does impact directly on our, on our margins. So the inflationary impact of, of uh, energy prices is playing into the broader commodity markets because it's that uh, you know, the cost of, of mining, the cost of uh, transport, um, and you've seen, you know, commodity prices, I guess I look more closely at the iron ore price, but we've seen some volatility in the iron ore price as well. So everything that we're doing is very focused around um, taking a long-term view, not just the next quarter or the quarter after that, taking a very long-term view and, and seeing a, a world where supply of energy um, becomes either more volatile or the security of supply or the cost, just the pure cost, means that we have to continue to do everything we can to future-proof and renewable energy is a great source of, uh, and the more, the more you have, the cheaper it gets. Absolutely. And I think maybe my final question goes back to my first comment on COP27. Uh, for those of us who follow COP27, actually this year, most of us would say it's a failure. Mm. It was a failure. There were a few highlights that came out of that, but in general, the targets set in COP26 did not actually reflect what we hope to see in COP, at COP27. Mm. However, Fortescue was there. Most miners were not included. However, this time they opened the door just that little bit mm. to allow mining companies and the private sector to have a view and to have a say. 
could you give us maybe your reflections for mining companies based on what was discussed at COP27? It's a very big question, I know. Yeah, look, I, my overall uh, perception, and, and, and I was there, and, and, and you, you hear some of the, uh, I guess, presentations uh, from the UN in particular, and it is quite alarming in terms of what we're seeing. The, tar the Paris target uh, at this rate will not be achieved, and the impacts for us and the globe are, uh, are, are pretty alarming. And so my takeaway is that business as usual is over and that we need to do more. We need to be more ambitious. Uh, I think the mining sector's got a very big part to play in that. It's not something we can just leave to government. I think heavy industry more broadly has a significant role to play in at least setting targets that will put us on a better pathway. We still may not achieve the targets that had previously be, been set. So, uh, look, I, I would agree. One of the things that was interesting is that I think a year, I wasn't at Glasgow a year earlier, um, but at the time, I think discussion around green hydrogen, there was a lot of scepticism about the part that green hydrogen might play. Uh, 12 months forward, and there is that, that, that there was actually uh, acknowledgement that green hydrogen will have a very important part to play in the energy transition. So I think there are some things that have moved on. There's been the green hydrogen standard that's been published um, this year as well. So there's progress. Uh, um, and an acknowledgement of the technology advancements that will play a part in decarbonising. But it, that my key takeaway is we have to do more. Yeah. And we all have to be more ambitious, set um, more challenging targets. Um, and you know, I often say if, if you're sitting around the board table and thinking you've got a net zero 2050 target and therefore you've done your job, I would, I would put the challenge out that that isn't doing your job because 2050 is simply too late. Mm -hmm. So more needs to be more needs to be done, um, and I think we have the the ability to do it. I think my takeaway is it's business unusual, not business as usual. Mm. And with that, can we all thank Elizabeth for joining us? Today? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Elizabeth.